This month, Russia drew the rotating presidency of the UN Security Council, despite a round of public relations attacks from Washington and its allies pointing to the Ukraine conflict, business as usual has prevailed, as it does whenever any of the 15 members of the council takes over the chair at the beginning of each month. Russia's Ambassador Vasilina Benzia described the resolution offered by his government at Monday's meeting asking the council to examine the risks of illicit weapons exports and to discuss arms control. Distinguished colleagues, the issue of control over the transfer of conventional weapons and military equipment recently have become especially relevant. The risks associated with their unchecked spread and their falling through black markets into the hands of criminals and terrorists are rising exponentially. We believe that today's debate is a good opportunity to discuss with a wide circle of member states existing regional and international agreements in this area, as well as the threats stemming from their violation. Izumi Nakamitsu, UN Under Secretary General and High Representative for Disarmament Affairs, detailed the urgent need for greater supervision of the international arms trade. Mr. President, distinguished members of the Security Council, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the illicit and unregulated trade and the diversion of weapons and their ammunition has been a major concern for the international community. Illicit and unregulated arms transfers can instigate, fuel, prolong armed conflict, armed violence, terrorism and crime. They can destabilize entire regions, contribute to and enable human rights abuses, and lead to violations of arms and embargoes. To respond to the risks associated with illicit and unregulated arms transfers, states have established a number of international, regional, and bilateral arms control treaties, agreements, and frameworks to prevent and eradicate the illicit trade and diversion of conventional arms, to regulate the international arms trade, and to promote transparency in weapons transfers. At the international level, this includes, for, in for instance, the Arms Trade Treaty, whose 10th anniversary we have just marked on 2nd of April, as well as the UN program for program of action on small arms and light weapons, the international tracing instrument, and the firearms protocol. These instruments vary in scope and membership, but they are all guided by the overwhelming principle of preventing and combating the illicit trade in arms. My office shares this objective and has been supporting states in the full and effective implementation of these instruments. As such, member states are urged to comply with their international obligations under the agreements to which they are parties. Mr. President, regulating the international arms trade and preventing the illicit trade of conventional weapons and ammunition requires robust frameworks for the effective control over the export, brokering, import, transit, storage, and retransfer of weapons and ammunition. Emanating from any arms transfer is the inherent risk of diversion of the equipment to unauthorized end users. Measures to counter the potential diversion of weapons and ammunition contribute to international peace and security, particularly to conflict resolution and prevention efforts. In accordance with international norms, any transfers of arms and ammunition should include pre-transfer risk assessments and post-shipment controls, such as on-site inspection and end-user verifications. Preventing diversion also requires cooperation and information exchange between importing, transit, and exporting states, appropriate accounting practices, and safeguardings of arms and ammunition, as well as customs and border control measures. Tracing weapons and ammunition is another important measure 
to effectively addressing diversion. This requires the marking of conventional weapons and their ammunition, record keeping, and protocols for international cooperation need to be in place. Transparency in armaments is yet another confidence building measure which can serve to reduce tensions, ambiguities, and misperceptions between member states. The UN Register of Conventional Arms, which was established in 1992, remains a key tool in this regard. I strongly encourage all member states to participate in this transparency mechanism by reporting on exports and imports of equipment that falls within the Register's seven categories of major conventional arms, as well as small arms and light weapons and procurement through national production. I also call on all states that have not yet done so to, um, to join the Arms Trade Treaty. Finally, I can call on states to consider the different differential impact of the illicit trade of arms and ammunition on women, men, girls and boys. Taking this into account, we must guarantee the full, equal, meaningful and effective participation of women in decision making and implementation processes related to conventional arms control. Only then we can make the real contribution to international and regional peace, security and stability, reduce human suffering and promote transparency and cooperation. I thank you very much for your attention, Mr. President. The Biden administration, for all its talk about the urgent need for gun control at home, did not address the merits of Russia's proposal at all, instead deflecting to criticism of Russia's military action in Ukraine. This was the Deputy U.S. Permanent Representative to the U.N., Robert A. Wood, on Monday. Today's meeting is a thinly veiled effort to portray Russia as a responsible actor in arms control, attempting to obfuscate the reality that it launched an unjustified armed invasion of its neighbor. Despite the circumstances that bring us here today, I thank the High Representative for Disarmament Affairs for her thoughtful and thorough briefing today. For over two decades, the United States has assisted other governments in developing and adopting the necessary laws, regulations, and policies to control the import and export of conventional weapons. We do this because we know that transparent laws and regulations allow countries to work together to hinder the illicit proliferation of these weapons. Our own policy on international arms transfers is laid out in our conventional arms transfer policy which was updated earlier this year and is a matter of public record. Even with strong laws and wise policies in place, there are inherent risks of weapons capture and illicit diversion on the battlefield in any armed conflict. The United States takes these risks very seriously. We assess the risk for potential illicit diversion of weapons when evaluating any proposed defense transfer anywhere in the world and take proactive steps to protect U.S. defense and dual-use technologies and prevent their diversion. We also carefully assess the risk of battlefield loss, particularly in complex environments. And let us focus on the most conspicuous such environment today, Ukraine. We must not pretend that the conflict in Ukraine is a matter of weapons export systems. Ukraine was invaded and it has every right to defend itself. This is reflected in the UN Charter. And the international community has every right to continue its long-standing support to Ukraine's defense. This equipment provides important support to Ukraine, and Ukraine has a strong incentive to protect it. The United States continues to work closely with Ukraine to establish and implement procedures to mitigate the risk of illicit diversion of weapons and military equipment. The government of Ukraine is committed to appropriately safeguarding and accounting for transfer defense equipment. We welcome the Ukrainian government's formation of a commission in 2022 to strengthen the monitoring of donated military equipment just this summer. Russia, on the other hand, has never let facts interfere with its false narratives. In a blatant effort to discredit Ukraine and weaken international support 
for Ukraine's self-defense. Russia continues to spread disinformation about diversions. In fact, the greatest risk of illicit trafficking comes from battlefield capture of weapons by Russia and pro-Russia forces. Russia has proposed that it would supply captured weapons to separatists in eastern Ukraine. These statements and actions are dangerous and irresponsible. Russia has also turned to rogue regimes to try to unlawfully obtain weapons and equipment to support its military operations. In November 2022, the DPRK delivered infantry rockets and missiles into Russia for use by the Kremlin-backed Wagner Group. And we know Russia is actively seeking to acquire additional munitions from the DPRK. Such arms transfers from the DPRK to Russia directly violate Security Council resolutions. These actions, particularly by a permanent member of the Security Council, are deeply disturbing and only fuel Moscow's brutal war of aggression against Ukraine. Iran has also transferred UAVs to Russia, a fact Iran's foreign minister acknowledged in public statements on November 5. Russia is using these drones to attack Ukraine's civilian infrastructure. Let me state it clearly. Resolution 2231, specifically Annex B, Paragraph 4, prohibits all countries, even permanent members of the UN Security Council, from transferring these types of drones from Iran without advanced Security Council approval. The most effective and obvious path towards peace and reducing, reducing risk of illicit diversion of arms would be for Russia to end the war that it started and withdraw its forces from all of Ukraine's sovereign territory. We once again urge Russia to do so and to do it now. Thank you. What Ambassador Wood did not address was the $100 billion worth of arms sent to Ukraine's military over the past 14 months with, even as U.S. media has admitted, little to no oversight and no verification of where the weapons were delivered. There have been many reports that the weapons have ended up on the black market. China also noted that one country, in an obvious reference to the U.S., has a long lax regime of military exports and has transferred military hardware to numerous non-state actors. For KPFK, I'm Don DeBar.